Good morning, everyone, or, or good afternoon, if you join us from the uh, eastern part of the world. And welcome to the Lafarge Holsim, Lafarge Holsim Foundation webinar on the impact that the ongoing COVID-19 crisis has and will have on our built environment. A particular welcome to our panelists, who I will introduce in a minute after a few words of housekeeping and introduction. My name is Cédric Demeus. I work for Lafarge Holsim and I will be your moderator this morning. There are close to 400 plus participants, so all the participants are muted, all the cameras are off, except for the panelists, of course. Having said that, you all have access to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use it. Don't be shy. Ask your questions to our panelists, and I will make sure to, uh, to insert as many of those questions uh, as, uh, as possible. Um, someone has appeared on screen, which I will uh, try to remove, but I can't, so I will, I will go on. Um, over the next hour, uh, we will explore the different facets that the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis is bringing on the construction sector and the uh, built environment. Our conversation is underpinned by a survey conducted by the Lafarge Olsim Foundation for Sustainable Construction. You can find that online. For those who do not know the foundation, it is a nonprofit body that aims to raise awareness on the role of architecture, engineering, urban planning and construction in achieving a sustainable built environment. Uh, this survey shows that the ongoing COVID-19 crisis will likely bring permanent and significant changes to architecture and urban planning. On the one hand, it calls for new appropriate long-term strategies versus short-term reactive actions. For instance, the, reason, uh, the recent adaptation of many of our buildings into hospitals have shown that these buildings must be as flexible as possible already when they are planned. Likewise, urban densification, very much supported in terms of energy, resources, mobility, efficiency. It raises questions on its compatibility with concepts that we must apply today, such as social uh, distancing. And that brings an expectation that this pandemic shock will or must act as a catalyst for the implementation of new, more sustainable, more socially minded construction concepts. And that brings me to the other side of the coin, which is the economic uh, aspect. The impact of uh, ongoing lockdowns has been very different and het heterogeneous around the globe. 100% dependent on, on local policies being, being enforced. However, there is one commonality. That is that construction, the construction ecosystem um, is seen as one of the most reliable engine for economic recovery. And at the same time is a formidable vector to accelerate on a large scale, the implementation and uptake of sustainable construction practices. Uh, and, and thus creating a demand for those, those solutions. So that brings an expectation that construction must be embedded in stimulus packages, but in a way that accelerates uh, uh, the transition towards circular and low carbon models. To discuss this complex issue, I'm uh, uh, a privileged to welcome Brinda uh, Samaya. Brinda, you are an architect based in Mumbai, India. Uh, one of the many things that you are well known for is to merge architecture, conservation and social equity in the projects that you are working on. Very welcome, Brinda. We have Maria Atkinson joining us from Australia. Uh, Maria, you are a renowned sustainability and sustain a sustainable construction expert, and you are notably the co-founder and founding CEO of the Green Building Council of Australia. You're very welcome, Maria. And finally, we have uh, Lord Ada Turner, who joins us from the UK. Ada, you've worked uh, uh, in the financial sector and industry for, for many years. You were chairing the UK's first climate change uh, um, uh, commission. You are now chairing the 
um, Energy Transition Commission, which is a global coalition of industry, investors, NGOs, working out pathways to decarbonize our economy. What I will do is I will each uh, give you each a five minute uh, uh, fire starter to share your, your, your perspective and then we will move into a, a, a discussion. So let me start with uh, uh, Brinda, whose experience of the lockdown in, in India um, um, may give her a, a very different perspective from what we, we may have lived in different parts of the world, especially in terms of labor conditions and, and, and transport infrastructure. So Brinda, the, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, may I first thank the Lafarge Wholesome Foundation for inviting me to be a panelist on this webinar. A special thanks to Cedric, of course, Eddie, and of course, the co-panelists. If you don't mind, I will be reading out this five minutes uh, little note because I don't want to forget anything over here. I would like to begin with a quote from Arundhati Roy, the Indian author and activist and an architect by education. She says, Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. The topic today is what impact will COVID-19 have on the built environment? Obviously, this enormous question cannot be answered uniformly. Every country will have to create its own questions and naturally its own answers. I will say a few words about my country as I'm sure we will then move into a global perspective during this discussion. In India, our lives are intertwined with our history, geography, culture, architecture. India is almost as big as Europe without Russia. It has a multiplicity of civilizations within it, many countries in one. So the solutions and answers will be complex and many. We will need new and relevant long-term strategies to learn from the situation today and plan the way forward. So the importance of the built environment should never be underestimated and thus the importance and power of good design is even more crucial in the global south. Simple design changes will have to be considered, whether it's elevators, gyms, food courts, all sorts of things, including perhaps even more office space to encourage and emphasize social distancing. Real estate needs and hence construction activity will be impacted in the short term, but countries like India are talking about escalating infrastructure activities roads, metros, bridges, we will have to wait and watch. I believe we will always need collaboration and a continuous desire for social contact. So working from home may not be a permanent solution for all. Certainly in India with crowded residential facilities, this is not an answer. There are always winners and losers in such situations. So we must devise a program for survival and resilience and a medium term blueprint for growth and structural transformation. We are all in the midst of this journey together. We have many obstacles and challenges ahead, but I believe this will also bring out the best in each one of us. We must leverage each other's strengths and rise individually and collectively to this challenge. We now rely on each other as never before. Many of you may have heard this saying, its origin is not confirmed, a crisis is too valuable an opportunity to waste. So this time of the pandemic and its effects have given us time to reflect and think about our own actions and goals. We need agency, the capacity of individuals to act independently and make free choices. We can only prioritize sustainability and thus nature when we redefine our lives and thoughts. We need to discuss and debate but always with hope. Thank you. Thank you, Brinda. Uh, many questions raised to mind already, but, but let me first turn to, to, to Maria. And if I'm not wrong, Maria, I think you, you see this crisis as a once a generation opportunity to, uh, 
accelerate the integration of sustainability in, in planning, in construction practices and, and what we do. So the, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Cedric. I, I love that we're a fire starter. So my few minutes, um, I too will read. Um, and then we will get into the, the discussion and I hope there's lots of <laughs> questions coming through the Q&A. Yes. So I think the reality of today is that we've exceeded our atmosphere's capacity to cope with an ever-increasing greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, last year saw the record emission levels and the past decade saw the hottest on record. The average global surface temperature rose to 1.1 degrees Celsius. So if we want to limit the increase to two degrees, which is actually accepting the catastrophic impacts of more severe weather events, like fires, floods, storms, hurricanes, et cetera, we need conservatively a 25% reduction in our emissions by 2030, the next decade. If we want the temperature to be no greater than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to achieve a 55% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. So if you are or you know a policymaker in a city where 70% of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings, then we have to act on energy productivity. We need clear effective policies that not just design, uh, but also deliver. And the important thing is to deliver and measure that we have delivered. So we don't just need promises, we don't just need words, we need action, we need recording, we need reporting. We need policies that require the stimulus of construction activities to specify energy productivity and that investors, developers, designers, builders and the entire supply chain are on the hook for the outcomes, for the performance. They are responsible for the results of genuine reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, achieving greater than 50% reduction in emissions for every single project. I've spent the last 20 years advocating ways to halve energy demand in our buildings. And the good news is it's all possible. We've got all the technology, all the skills, we've got everything we need to have for new buildings and the ones we already have to be more efficient. So 18 countries from developed countries have had a decline in carbon dioxide equivalent emissions over the last 10 years. So I wanted to understand how are they doing it? How are they able to achieve a reduction in emissions? And there's three activities that emerge from the group. As Brenda said, each country has its own priorities and its own conditions to be met. But it's interesting that there are key three activities that are crucial to achieve the reduction in emissions. The first one, a decline in energy use. The second, a high penetration of renewable energy in the electricity sector. And the third, a high number of energy and climate policies in place that enable investment and innovation, measuring, monitoring and reporting of outcomes. So put simply, the policy and investment priorities that will get greenhouse gas emissions out of our economy are clean energy and reductions in energy per unit of production, known as energy productivity. And the actions are pretty simple, they're known. As I said, we've got all the design skills, products and technologies, and to be frank, we absolutely have everything we need. So that's every building, houses, apartments, offices, hotels, hospitals, education facilities, and also the shops. Policymakers must immediately lift standards and prioritise spending to upgrade the energy performance of buildings. The new ones with better design procurement and the old ones with shading, better heating and cooling solutions that have clean and fresh air, but are also super efficient. So we need our construction sector to choose the low carbon non-polluting products and upgrade appliances and industrial equipment to meet best practice energy demand, require renewable energy on every available rooftop and plan for and invest in electric vehicle infrastructure and then prioritise the strategic objectives that suit the location to close the loop on our very destructive take, make, throw away behaviours and mandate the changes for low carbon circular economy that make sense for our city, our country and the planet. We need to link the dollars, the planning approval to measuring it so that we learn what is and is not working and keep going to achieve our 1.5 degree future 
by 2030. Thank you, Maria. I'm, I'm, I'm now urging to dive into questions, but before, before we do so, we, we need to cover a third angle, uh, which, which is the role of, of, of the sector that can play in the, in the recovery phase. So Ada, I'm, I'm turning to you for that. The floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you very much. As Cedric says, I, I chair this organization called the Energy Transition Commission, which is a global coalition of companies and environmental NGOs. And we believe that the overall objective should be to get the world to net zero emissions by 2050, and that that is absolutely possible technologically and at a surprisingly uh, small economic cost. Within that, uh, we are very aware and we have focused significantly on the materials that go into the construction sector, and in particular, steel and cement. Uh, steel and cement in their actual production uh, account for about 4.5 gigatons of emissions, which is about 12 or 13% of the emissions uh, from the energy and industrial system. And if we do nothing, that percentage will grow because we do know how to decarbonize electricity a, a, a production, but dealing with these sectors is a bit more difficult. But it's still absolutely possible, and there are two big things we can do to take the emissions out of steel and cement. One is the ones that uh, Maria has talked about, the whole area of greater efficiency in our use of materials within our buildings. We can build buildings more efficiently, and we can also create a greatly more recycled uh, circular economy. But to the extent that we still will always need to produce uh, steel and cement, we also know how, at a cost, uh, to produce those in a zero carbon fashion using technologies such as hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. But the construction industry is even more important than those figures of the emissions from producing their materials suggest because it affects the energy efficiency and the resource efficiency of the entire building stock and the entire a, a built uh, environment. One of the most crucial drivers of electricity demand across the world is air conditioning. So the issue of how we insulate houses well that have thermal inertia in terms of their cool characteristics is key. But actually it's even more important when you turn from heating because at least air conditioning is automatically electric and we can make the electricity zero carbon. If you go to the mid and high latitudes where we have very significant use of gas in central heating, replacing that with electricity uh, is really a challenge if you don't simultaneously hugely improve the insulation of the building stock. It's a challenge because when you hit the middle of winter, you will have peak demands on your electricity for heating a badgedly insulated housing stock, which will be very difficult to meet. But it's not just the efficiency of buildings, it's also the efficiency of the entire bu uh, built environment. Uh, we in the ETC, in the relation to our transport space, have used the illustration, as have others, of the difference between Atlanta, a widely spread out urban environment, and Barcelona, a dense pack urban environment. If you work out their transport emissions per head of population, Atlanta is five times Barcelona. We are gonna build cities uh, across the world, particularly uh, in Africa uh, in the course of the next 50 years. If they look like Atlanta, rather than like Barcelona or Shanghai, we have a very major problem in, in terms of the energy efficiency of this. So we're very aware that construction uh, is hugely important. And we're also very aware that it's important as we think about how we recover from the COVID-19 crisis. And we've recently, uh, in the ETC, put out a document called Seven Priorities for Policy uh, to Drive a Green Recovery. We are beginning, we hope, to come out of the immediate health crisis and governments throughout the world, and we are in contact with many of them, are thinking about the policies to drive recovery. Now, one of the things that you'd like to do is just get consumer spending going again, but that's actually very difficult when the hospitality sector, even as we come out of lockdown, is subject to all sorts of constraints and people are worried about traveling. So inevitably, governments are gonna look at 
investment? How do they encourage investment uh, in order to drive economic recovery? And investment is one of the things that government is typically a lever that government can pull more directly than it can pull uh, consumption. But I think we have to understand and we have to guard against a danger that an investment-led recovery and a construction investment-led recovery could, if we get it wrong, be a disaster for the climate. We've seen this before. We've seen it particularly the case in China. If you go back to China from 2009 to 12, after the global financial crisis, to keep their economy going, they unleashed the biggest concrete pouring uh, spasm that the world has ever seen. And that drove Chinese emissions from 7.5 gigatons to 10 gigatons in the course of three years. Because if you simply say, we're going to build highways, we're going to build airports, we're going to build new buildings, and you don't get it right, you will create a hugely carbon intensive uh, recovery. And we need uh, to guard uh, against that. Uh, we need to make sure, also as Cedric said, that coming out of this crisis, we don't turn our back on the dense city, which is so much more uh, energy efficient, and say, look, what people now want is house in, houses in spread out suburbs because those are safer in a COVID-19 crisis. But that could be the reaction because let me tell you, Barcelona has had a much higher death rate than Atlanta. And that's partly because it's much more difficult to do social distancing and keeping well apart in a dense environment with a mass transit system than in a spread out suburban environment where everybody gets in their nice little cocoon cars. So we have a major challenge about how to get people back confident using the energy efficient forms of urbanization, which involve mass transit systems, uh, rather than the spread out suburban environment. So we have got to, and it will be clear that the built environment, energy efficiency improvement, retrofit of buildings could be a major driver of economic recovery. And uh, for instance, in the UK, there's a very strong uh, focus on that as there is across the whole of Europe. How do we re use retrofit of buildings to create jobs, which tend to be local jobs available in every area of the economy? But how do we do that? And how do we also build big infrastructure projects, including renewable energy projects, in a way which is as zero carbon as possible. I think this is the huge challenge. Construction and investment stimulus in construction and in retrofit of existing buildings will, I think, be a major part of COVID-19 recovery, economic recovery programs across the world. But if we get them wrong, let's be clear, it's going to be a setback uh, for progress uh, on the climate. We absolutely have to get them right and we need to make sure that we design them to reinforce the progress towards the energy and carbon efficient future that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you for this uh, uh, introduction. And um, I can't help but jumping to, to a first question to, to Brinda. We, we've heard uh, both Maria and, and Ada focusing quite a bit on the um, climate change and circularity part of, uh, uh, of, of, of this transition. Um, what does this green agenda mean uh, for countries um, such as India and for, for you as an architect based in uh, 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 Mumbai? Is it um, an adaptation uh, necessity? Is it a moral priority? Is it a, uh, a blue sky thinking led by uh, more developed countries? How, how do you see this green agenda in, in relation to construction in countries such as India? While I was listening to Lord Turner, while my mind was agreeing with him, I almost felt I was on a different planet because so many of the things which he's mentioned uh, are, is not really going to happen in our country. And I doubt that very much. For instance, uh, he was talking about heavy investment and infrastructure. This is the first thing that our government's talking about. We have 465 million migrant workers in our country and 160 million of them are in the construction industry connected with that. Normal construction activities come to a halt. So our government is talking about ramping up investment, 
in bridges and highways and metro systems, everything that uses heavy materials of steel, concrete, etc. So it's, you know, what you do there. Secondly, the government has actually opened the coal mines uh, to the private sector recently. So they're allowing private uh, people, private corporations to mine coal. So they're certainly obvious, you know, we have the third largest uh, uh, story, this thing of coal in the world. So there's no question of cutting it down. And thirdly, the, the density of the cities, everybody is talking about how do we get back to normal? Uh, I, I think uh, that's not going to happen, frankly. I think we have to really think out of the box and we have to have a very, very different set of policies and solutions in country like ours. And I think what's really important, because we have now realized how interconnected we are. If there is one person with COVID in uh, Kampala in Uganda, uh, a person in New York City is not safe anymore. So the connection is huge. So we've got to start thinking globally, what are the solutions for us? What would you do if you were in our place? What are the solutions you would bring to the table in a country like India, which is going to impact globalization and, and, and the climate hugely with our political system, with our bureaucratic system, with our wealth and with our poverty, with our education, with our ideologies. These are the solutions we want our own people to make, but we want it to be globally done as well. Hmm. And some of the solutions that are coming today are not going to be able to be implemented as I see it in countries like India. So um, perhaps the example or, 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 or progress can be advanced in, in, in other countries. And, and Maria, you, you referred quite a lot to a, a, um, a policy environment we need to evolve. And um, I fully agree with you. And the question that comes to mind is, um, in the construction sector, wherever we are in the world, we, we, the construction sector is characterized by a, a massive and hyper-fragmented value chain. And, and the question is, how do you bring this whole value chain along in this movement, uh, um, as opposed to focusing on, on certain sub-segments or certain sub-sectors, and, and, and you're able to uh, create a movement across the, 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 the all the decision making process in, in this value chain. How do you see that? Thank you, Cedric. Um, I see it the same in India as in Dubai, as in London, as in Sydney, as in Atlanta, as in Barcelona. There is always in construction a link to money and the funding should be linked to the environmental outcomes and performance. So we have all of our systems designed in the property sector to funding a developer who finds the project, then the developer gets the approval to do it, and then the builder comes along and says to the developer, yes, I can do it, and then the supply chain gets minimal minimal uh, say and has to deliver it. So if we change it and that performance is linked to money and that we have in the chain, this is a dramatic shift that can occur, we can get to the policy and legislation, but can occur through simple contract obligations that I'm already seeing occur in the response to having to address climate change, in the response to having to address health, welfare, well-being, already in large projects, I'm seeing it at the moment. Enabling those supply chains, and I see so many examples, I'm pretty frustrated that the ways of doing it better exist, but they're not yet at scale. And it enables the transformation that needs to occur with the supply chain providing better products, better services that are measurable towards the environmental outcomes. So for example, the Clean Air Act exists in most countries about measuring pollutant levels. And it goes on and on and on. In places like India, the type of, uh, if it's a high rise, the type of vertical movement 
of people, the type of cooling system, whether it has refrigerant or not, is all prescribed by big global players. This is not down to the small, unskilled worker. So tying performance, linking the design promises to the absolute operational performance, I think will lift the supply chain, enabling product services technologies to come in, innovate, get to scale, we've seen it on small scale, and, and quite frankly, go back to good vernacular architecture that Brinda leads in. Um, so fundamentally, rethinking what we already know. So turning it on its head is what I believe and linking performance with the money. So thank you for that, uh, Mary Ann. And um, Ada, let's turn to you, linking performance to the money. That's a, um, a concept that's very much been um, talked about, uh, at least in Europe, where, where uh, governments and, and, and uh, um, the European Union has been quite uh, rapid and comprehensive to, to launch an em embedded um, construction in, in the recovery package. Do you think that addressing climate change will be or will come in parallel to that, that we will be able in Europe, for instance, where we have a more, let's say, advanced uh, 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 climate policy framework and, and, and monetary uh, uh, framework um, to, to link performance to money? Um, I'm somewhat confident. I mean, on the whole, what has happened over the last three months in the European debates has been more favorable than I might have thought. Um, there is, uh, and the background to this is that Europe as a continent at the European Union level, at the UK level, at individual uh, countries within the European Union, it is increasingly committed to net zero, net zero by 2050. Um, and sometimes people say, well, that's just virtue signaling. But as somebody once said to me, the great thing about virtue signaling is it sometimes leads on to virtue um, because once you've made that commitment it's hard to escape the consequences of it and because that was in place when we went into this crisis i think the extent to which the recovery packages which are being put forward are linked uh, to green objectives is actually quite impressive i mean for instance if i take a particular uh, environment where you wouldn't necessarily have expected that support for the automotive uh, industry in Germany. Um, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has been under huge pressure, lobbying pressure uh, from the German automotive industry to just give support for people to buy new internal combustion engines. And she said, no, the only form of subsidy we're gonna give is to electric vehicles. Now that has surprised me and encouraged me. There are now very significant amounts of money being put together by different countries or by the European Union, and they are clearly within the context of a Green New Deal. Now, will it be perfect? No, no, it won't. Um, but I do think the direction of change in Europe uh, is more favorable than I, I dared hope uh, three years ago. Now, the crucial thing, of course, is in the detail of the delivery. When you say, yes, we are going to support you know, green retrofit of buildings. For instance, the UK government has just announced a large expenditure on, you know, repairing our schools and building new schools. How do we make sure that those have real green criteria in terms of both the materials that go into them, the design for energy efficiency? The devil is in the detail, uh, but the, the direction is there. If I can just pick up Brinda's point, you know, I entirely accept, I, I'm very worried about India at the moment. Uh, my co-chair, of the Energy Transition Commission is Dr. RJ Mathur of the Energy and Resources Institute of the in India. Uh, I will be with him on a panel with our commission uh, on uh, Thursday as we compare what is happening in Europe, what is happening in China, what is happening in Australia, what is happening uh, in India, which are our major areas of op uh, operation. And I think there are major challenges in India. I think the tendency will be to simply say, let's start pouring concrete to build bridges to get those migrant workers going again. But we will have to look for you know, people in India to come up with ideas for how we turn that around. I think all that we can do in Europe uh, and elsewhere to help, and I think Maria is suggesting this, is making sure that the technologies are pushed as fast as possible to make sure that you know, there is uh, 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 
cooling systems which are as energy efficient as possible. You can, for instance, achieve huge increases in the coefficient of performance of air conditioners, uh, which dramatically uh, improve their efficiency. So I think there will be a benefit uh, from these forceful European policies because then they spin off examples and they spin off technologies which make it easier for developing countries, cheaper for them to go down that route. But ultimately, India will have to find uh, its own route to avoiding what you say is absolutely uh, uh, the case, a, a danger that the government will simply reach for quantity of investment rather than quality of investment uh, as the way out uh, of its employment creation challenge. So we, we've touched upon the, uh, the role of, of governments in, in different parts of the world. And, and one of the questions we get through the, uh, uh, the, the chat here is, what, what is or will be the role of, of private sector in implementing these stimulus packages? Or uh, if we look at Europe, the, the, the EU Green Deal, for instance, and can this become a blueprint to drive sustainable growth uh, align with the circularity and climate agenda uh, in other region. What was the role of the private sector? Do any of you have a, uh, an input to that? Well, I'm helping a, um, a large construction company right now, Cedric, respond to a project. And it has a, a commitment, a minimum commitment to 20% reduction in embodied energy. Um, and in the process of life cycle assessment, it has key environmental performance criteria and so I'm already seeing projects where the supply chain is having to come together in different ways and collaborate to collectively put to the builder solutions that they can bid on. So I'm quite optimistic that the private sector, this is a private project, privately funded um, with key criteria, but the private sector is a listed company with shareholders and community stakeholders, and therefore back to Brinda and Lord Turner's comment is we need uh, the pressure to, to be bought. And I think that the market itself, uh, if it's tied to performance, and it needs to be like, it can't just be an individual building. Um, in order to get to the 1.5 degree, we can halve the energy demand of an average building anywhere. But if we want to get the kind of infrastructure transformation that we've heard about, the, the green electricity that we need, the renewable energy, the ways in order to do that is we need to think of precinct, city block and the whole city. So I'm very keen that policies and money start to think beyond the building to the overall performance. And I'm also quite adamant with our 2050 goal of zero carbon, that all sources and all sectors will have to report on carbon. And we might as well take the impetus of stimulus funding and activity to make the building sector be the first that has the kind of cap and trade model that needs to work. And uh, I mean, we've all, we all know how to do it. It's not a question of how. It's the willing impetus of policy and performance reporting measures. Mm. If I, I, I will do my best not to talk about carbon pricing. <laughs> Ada, you wanted to come in. Well, I just wanted to pick up uh, uh, on what Maria said there, that all sectors have to get to net zero. What we found is that the increasing acceptance of that is hugely powerful. There's been a real shift in a lot of corporate points of view as people have begun to talk about net zero by 2050. Because as long as everybody was talking about an 80% reduction by 2050, any one individual company or sector could always say, I completely agree with this 80% reduction target, but I'm a really difficult sector. I'm in the 20%, so I don't need to do anything. But the realization that we've got to get to net zero has allowed no hiding space. Every sector, aviation, shipping, the building sector, steel, they've all got to get to net zero. And what it really encourages me is that an increasing number of companies are accepting that. Now, what is the balance between public action and private action? At one level, if you were a pure free market economist, you could say the public sector could do it all. It just sort of regulates, or to your point, Cedric, it sets a 
a carbon price. And within that, purely selfish companies will realize that they've got to meet these regulations and they've got to meet these carbon price. So they'll decarbonize because it's in their economic interest. But that's not the most efficient way to do it. The most efficient way is a very constructive dialogue and self-reinforcing process between the public sector and the private sector. It does require the public sector in construction to leave, use the lever of public procurement to demand high standards in buildings. It does require often a, a regulation. That regulation should not specify the specific technology, but should specify the end objectives of how efficient uh, buildings have to be. But it's incredibly powerful if simultaneously you have businesses and in particular leading businesses saying we can get to net zero here's how we can get to net zero and rather than us being the business lobby groups which are continually telling the governments go away don't put pressure on us to have leading companies themselves saying this would be intelligent regulation that helps us to get to net zero and we are going to uh, argue for it and we are increasingly seeing that we are increasingly seeing both countries and companies making net zero commitments. We are also, and we in the ETC are working very closely now with financial institutions which are making net zero commitments. I have to say, broadly speaking, what they've done is make net zero commitments and then turn to people like us to say, can you help us think through what on earth that means? You know, how as a financial institution do I know whether my lending or my equity investment is compatible with net zero. But all of this together, we have to use all of these levers uh, to drive uh, progress. And mm. you know, uh, some things make me depressed that the progress is far too low, and some things make me feel that we are beginning to get some momentum. So we simply have to maximize the momentum uh, along all of these dimensions. So go going back to, um architecture itself and, and the impact of, of, of the current crisis. Brinda, um, how can design for, for poorer communities or communities where um, shared social, social space is, uh, is a key element and how do you adapt for things like social distancing but still support the social fabric of, of the community? How do you see that evolving in the future? I think to go back to what uh, Adair said, you know, which is so important in a country like India, is that we must uh, accept that we have a huge critical mass of existing buildings. They may be ordinary buildings, but we should not all the time think we have to build new. We can restore, we can retrofit, we can rebuild, we can recycle, we can have re-architecture. But that's not the thinking. So there's got to be a change in mindset that we don't have to break everything down and build new. And that is why uh, that's been part of my practice for, for many decades, not just for beautiful, iconic buildings, but even for ordinary buildings. How do we retrofit them? How do we save the embodied energy? And what is happening is we have to understand what is it we need to take from the West. Now we have, of course, the LEED certification and for many years, we, many builders and developers began to build big glass boxes in a country like India and then have very expensive air conditioning to take care of the heat load. Now, this is absolutely the wrong way to go. I have to say that we now have our own systems like um, Greha in Delhi and our own ways of doing things which is coming in. So similarly, we have to look at the density of this informal housing, as it's very politely called, but essentially, which is slums, we cannot change the density of the cities. It is very important, I personally believe, this is my personal belief, that cities will be dense. And that's why that, their greatest strength comes from density, their art, their culture, their music, uh, social connections. That's why people, opportunity, that's why people come to the cities. And unlike the Western world, where migrants came from the rural areas into the city, when agriculture, like in the United States, was already a good system and was earning income, the people who come in from our agricultural rural areas come to the cities because they don't have opportunities in the rural areas, because land will be at a shortage, and they cannot go on fragmenting it as families grow. 
So they come for opportunity and that is why they put up with this very, very sad state of housing. Now, my belief is that unless there's change in government policy and political will and bureaucratic will comes, there cannot be change in the way we look at informal housing because the government still wants to own the land and people, however rich or poor they are, they will not invest in upgrading their accommodation, their public spaces, whether it's medical, whether it's toilet, sanitation, water supply, drainage, if they are fearful that at any time the government can come and take away the land. So the first thing we have to do is to give the, the land on which these informal houses exist today, at least in our cities, to the people who are living on that land and help them to help themselves to build up better conditions. And I have full belief uh, that they can do that. Like in Dharavi, there have been so many good solutions from students, from architects, from urban designers, planners, but nobody wants to implement any of those because there are too many vested interests and there's too much money involved because of the high value of these slums, which are right in the heart of a very, very expensive city. So this sort of huge mindset has to change. And I don't know whether post COVID, and I don't think post COVID is going to happen anytime soon. I think it's going to be a long term, long haul. So they're not going to be quick fixes or knee jerk reactions. And then suddenly we're out of it. We're not going to be out of it. So policy changes have to start coming in right from now. How are we going to make these changes and not wait for, for this to end, which is not going to end uh, in a hurry. Uh, and how are we going to address these issues? One of the questions that comes through the, uh, uh, the, the, the Q&A uh, function is, is how, very much in agreement with, with what all of you have said, is how do we expedite the introduction of, of, of new solutions that are already appearing on the market but which are not picked up at, at scale? And Maria, if I, if I can try to, to push you uh, a, a little bit in one of your reflections, you talked much about uh, uh, performance, performance measurement and, and reporting. What, what do you mean? Do you mean that we need to define um, CO2 performance per square meter or, or, or what do you have in mind? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And we know how to do it, Cedric. So, so you, have, you have to say that zero is 2050. Okay. So you have a trajectory of current emissions of a building, of a city, uh, of a country. And if you talk about the building sector, then it's very easy that you're actually putting a trajectory to the zero. Now, how fast buildings get there is up to their investment. It has to be measured on performance as well as um, the components that are being promised to go into the building, their performance outcomes. So you can't just say, um, I have something fabulously efficient for you, but not be on the hook for it being fabulously efficient. I think this is the difference. So in a trajectory, you are enabling essentially a market of cap and trade for buildings to operate. Now we've had Korea, Japan, many countries have identified for commercial building sector, terrific initiatives where if the building didn't have an investment capability, it was having to buy the carbon offsets to, um, to enable it to meet the ever decreasing level of energy required for that asset. Eventually, the asset becomes stranded or redundant if you follow just buying your way out of it. And so an investment will occur to improve the asset. So my um, clarity to you and everyone is that I'm absolutely saying that carbon emission per square meter performance is required, but specific to the location. Mm. There is no point in comparing the carbon footprint in Barcelona with Atlanta because they're different markets, the price difference, no one ever compares buy an apartment in Atlanta, it's cheaper than Barcelona. It's ridiculous, property is local. So the local conditions of climate, et cetera, will determine the trajectory, but we all have to get to the zero. And so essentially buildings should be playing. 
And I could talk at length about policy mechanisms to enable it, but uh, essentially a, a, a policy umbrella that sets the requirement for measuring the performance of greenhouse gas emissions, not just carbon, all the greenhouse gas emissions per square metre for a place is possible and it would activate and um, enable the innovations at scale that we know exist. So b building on that, um, uh, Ada, we, we've, I would like to, to come back to the point that embedding construction in uh, recovery and stimulus packages is good from an economic point of view, but could be a disaster if we don't, if we don't do it uh, um, rightly by integrating sustainability, carbon efficiency, resource efficiency, and so on. And that, that bridges the, the, the point that Maria just said. Um, how, how do you see um, the stimulus package that has been released in Europe, for example, which very much focuses on um, um, renovation, uh, energy renovation of, of built assets across Europe. And, and is there a policy priority that you believe is, is, is missing or, or, or should build, build up on, on top of what we have? Well, um, as you suggested, I, th I think the good news in Europe is that there is quite a lot of focus on this energy efficient renovation story. But by the way, that reflects a very particular challenge of Europe getting to net zero. When I look, for instance, at the UK plan of how to get to net zero, the most difficult bit is how to get the residential housing stock to net zero, uh, in an environment where there are large uh, winter heating peaks and we start with a terrible, a terrible, badly insulated old housing stock. Uh, that's less the case in some other countries in Europe, but everywhere there is a realization that renovation of the housing stock. So it reflects the fact that unlike, for instance, tropical climates, our, our big problem is not a, a, a diurnal a balance in the electricity system between solar by day, but you still want to run the air conditioners at night. Uh, our big problem is a seasonal balance issue. Uh, it's about uh, how do we deal with these large energy use peaks in the winter essentially coming from uh, the residential housing stock and in an environment where we have a stable population. Therefore, most of the story is about renovation. So the focus in Europe has reflected appropriately the specific characteristics of Europe. What would I add to it? Um, this in a sense, it goes back to several things we said. I, I, I mean, uh, Brenda said, and I agree, we've got to make the dense city work. And I think one of the things we've got to do is, is really think about uh, urban design and the use of urban space. I mean, one of the things that we do with urban space at the moment is we clutter it uh, with huge numbers of, you know, small steel boxes called cars, which sit around taking up expensive urban space. Um, and for 95% of the time, they sit around doing nothing. Uh, they are one of the most underutilized assets in the world. So I think what is beginning to appear, uh, you know, in Paris, in London, in Amsterdam, and we need to spread this as much as possible, it is a process of saying, as we come out of this crisis and in an environment where people are worried about the dense pack subway system, how do we unleash, free up as much street space as possible to be bicycles, to be pedestrian, to be micro mobility, you know, small cars rather than great big uh, uh, SUVs. We need to really think about and how do we green um, the city? How do we make it more uh, livable? How do we make it livable without just uh, retreating into, I saw one on the participant chat, you know, air conditioned glass houses. I mean, if we design things right, you can at least create a more natural cool environment rather than just relying on staying cool by maximizing your use of electricity. So I think one of the things which is an opportunity to think about is really to envision, to re-envision as much as possible, how we make the dense city work for everybody. Uh, and how do we, and I do think that that means in a sense, reclaiming, uh, quite a bit of street space, if possible, from the air-conditioned SUV, which is keeping a small number of people uh, in a pleasant environment, but at the expense uh, of imposing a big externality on other people. 
Mm. So keeping on infrastructure, Brinda, um, the, uh, g going back to, to the case of, of India, the, the lockdown or the beginning of the lockdown has shown a massive deficiency of the transport infrastructure across, across the country. Do, do you think that what you are living through now has changed the mindset in terms of urban planning and, and uh, um, engineering or, or has it yet to land? Actually, what Adair said was, was music to my ears because I've really been dreaming of pedestrianizing parts of Mumbai for decades. And we've, a group of us have come up with so many plans, hoping and dreaming that one day it will actually happen. And uh, I, I really hope and pray that, that post this or during this time, people will, will uh, think about this at least. So far, nothing. You know, India is becoming one of the largest manufacturer car of cars in the world, not just for ourselves, but for the world. And aspirations are such that everybody wants to own a car. And uh, unless a balance is created between manufacture, aspirations, and urban planners, we actually have to change mindsets that you don't necessarily need to come in a car, but you need good public uh, infrastructure. And that's why now we are getting metros in our cities. Because we cannot tell people you cannot come by car or bus or whatever and you have to walk, but there's no alternative system. So, you know, we're at a very difficult stage in India where we're trying to balance. Uh, we understand the problems with, with, with the climate, but we also have other issues where we can't implement all the things that are happening in the West unless we bring up certain other things up to par. So this balancing act is what's going to be very, very difficult. And uh, for this generation, I'm sure, uh, I hope there'll be some out of the box solutions. So transportation all over the country uh, is going to be new. It, we have to look at it in a different way. Um, you know, most the, the, compared to the 1.2 billion people we have, uh, the number of people who have cars is not that much, but it's still a huge number because of the numbers. But what's going to happen when more and more people aspire for this? So I don't have the answers. They're very difficult uh, answers to come up with. So and unfortunately, I, I have to move to, uh, to, to the final questions because we're getting close to, uh, to, to midday here in Brussels. And, and we only have uh, uh, two minutes to go. Um, if, if we look at what was happening pre-COVID, uh, we had um, a lot of changes starting to happen on the demand side of construction with uh, demand shift to um, logistics, uh, more warehousing, more uh, infrastructure, um, changes in investment criteria, an uptake of the sustainability agenda. On the supply side, we had an increased focus on the digitalization of value chain, the return to the regionalization of uh, supply chains, which are less vulnerable. So the, the question is, do, do you think that the, um, the COVID crisis and the, and the long recovery period, as Brinda said, uh, um, can potentially act as an accelerator uh, of all these trends and do you believe that this is an opportunity to really accelerate uh, a sustainability in construction across the value chain and across supply chain? Maria, I can perhaps start with you. Thank you, Cedric. Um, I'm going to answer that just for the region that I'm in, um, because uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I see that um, circular economy is being discussed because of issues in the supply chain. I'm seeing collaboration amongst businesses because of COVID, where there has been a community spirit of collaboration being extended into the supply chain. I'm seeing large and small businesses work in different ways compared to before. So I'm extremely optimistic that we have a crisis, that the two issues of climate change and COVID-19 are complementary because we've been able 
to pivot and change and quickly adapt in a pandemic crisis in the same way we need to quickly adapt and respond with climate change. But I still hold the fear that if we don't tie the money for recovery to performance, mm. we will end up where we've all said in our worst situation and we will bake into our city's productivity, the assets, the buildings, the infrastructure, a very hopeless uh, future for the next generation and the one after. And so to me, it is not just optimistic, it's critical that we do. So let me turn to you, Ada. Um, I think we will see the acceleration of some trends which were in place before the crisis. And, and I think they create quite a challenge for a government policy. Um, I think in particular, we are seeing an acceleration of a shift from bricks and mortar retailing to online retailing. You see that in the price of Amazon shares, you see that, uh, uh, and you've seen this in China, you've seen it in the US, you've seen it in Europe. I'm not so familiar whether this has occurred in, uh, in India as well, but certainly in those other areas, very major uh, shift of a, a, a people's purchase patterns to online for the obvious reason that they're stuck at home uh, and they need to do it. But I think that has accelerated a shift. Um, what that creates for government is, is a big challenge because it means there is a reduction in the number of jobs in the retailing online justice fair productivity system, just at the point where we have, as it were, had to switch off the job creating machine of hospitality, travel, entertainment, leisure, which is where the jobs in the developed countries have been coming from for the last 20 years. And so coming out of this crisis, we are going to face with countries much more focused on just how do we create jobs in a way which has not been the big focus on developed economy policies over the last 10 years. And that's why maximizing the jobs from things like building and renovation is really capturing politicians' uh, uh, imagination at the moment. But the other thing, of course, is if we are going to have this shift uh, to online uh, retailing as the increasingly dominant form of how we buy goods, we better make sure that that is as energy and climate efficient as possible. So really driving the last mile delivery to be an energy efficient process, rather than, it was Maria's point, the danger is that we simply take the technology that already exists, which is the sort of white van, the white internal combustion engine van, uh, driven by a driver, and we say, we now do online by filling that van and it trundles around the street. You actually need to completely re-envision how last mile delivery works, whether it is autonomous, whether it's small electric units, what is the size of those units, how do you electrify all the distribution trucks, which again, I'm glad to say that many of the most thoughtful looking people in that online delivery space, such as DHL, Deutsche Post, are, are beginning to, uh, to think about. So I think there will be an acceleration of structural change, but I think it does create a major job creating uh, a challenge, but also opportunity. Brinda. Well, of course, you know, we're such an enormous country and uh, a lot of things are dictated by the central government as well as, of course, we have the state governments. So a lot of policies will have to come out from think tanks. We hope that we will have very democratic and far-sighted uh, individuals who will bring new ideas uh, and fast. And, you know, what Adair said that already Europe is having policies and thinking of things apart from COVID. You know, how are they going to do things post COVID? What are the changes going to be? Uh, you don't see that much of that in the news here because people are struggling with just surviving under these situations. But I do believe optimistically that, that, there, will, that there is a shift and there will be a change in the younger generation as well. I think people have seen that they don't need as much as they think they need that they can do with less. And I think to me, that's the single most important thing. Do we need as much as we've been wanting? If we, each one of us, cuts down what we think we need, we've been stuck at home three months, we've not gone shopping, we've not gone out, we've not spent much money, but we've been reasonably okay, safe and happy. 
if we each believe that to save the planet and thus save it for our children and my grandchildren, that we, each one of us has to, at this point in time, take the oath that we, are, that we don't need as much as we think. We do. Thank you so much to the to, to the three of you. And for, unfortunately, we have to draw this conversation to a close, even if I would continue for, for hours. If we were together, I would give you each a, a small box of Belgian chocolates, but we, we will do without it today. <laughs> Many thanks to, to Maria, Brinda and Ada for joining us. And to our audience, we will transform this conversation into a podcast and, and, and we will be having other webinar with the Lafarge Holstein Foundation for Sustainable Construction very soon. Many thanks to all of you. Have a wonderful evening and rest of the day. And uh, looking forward to a continued conversation on, on another occasion.